Hi friends, my name is Hannah and welcome to a new reading vlog. Today is the 1st of February and last month I did something revolutionary for me with my reading vlog. I just went up to my bookcase, picked four books that I fancied reading, read them, had a delightful time, who knew that's that, that that's how you could read? So if this is your first time um, on my channel, hello, hi and welcome, um, but you might not have seen that I had a, a reading goal this year where I wanted to be more impatient with my reading. I wanted to just get to the books that I wanted to read. I'm a relatively new creator of content on, on booktube, or anywhere for that matter, and um, I was definitely finding last year that for parts of my reading, I was letting like having an idea for a theme of a vlog drive my reading rather than creating content on what I was actually reading. And what that meant is that I accumulated a lot of books that I was really excited about and was like waiting for like a convenient opportunity to read it to coincide with like a piece of content I wanted to create. And that's dumb. That's so dumb. Um, so this year, I'm, the content that I'm creating is just me being excited about reading some books. There'll be some themed stuff that crops up over time, but I definitely didn't want that to be the majority of what I was reading. So I've been up to my bookshelves and I have picked three books off of my shelf and I have one digital book that, um, that I'm going to be reading this month. I've picked smaller ones this month, uh, that's, that's three books, uh, than I did in January because, um, as I said, it's the 1st of February now and uh, I'm actually like not even halfway through two books that are over 500 pages. <laughs> so um, I'm filming this on the 1st of February knowing fine well, I'm probably not going to actually pick up any of these books in the next week. But for consistency I wanted to record it on the 1st of February. So what have I picked up? The first one is a book that I'm really excited to get to that I bought from Houseman's Books in King's Cross. It's like around the side of King's Cross Station and when I was in there last year the bookseller was going off on one about this book. This is I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman and I have been prompted to pick this up finally by seeing Simon over at Savage Reads absolutely rave about it. So this is about a group of women who are kept in a room or a cage underground. They have no memory of how they got there. They don't know what's going on and that's the premise of the book and then the next one I'm really excited about because again I've seen it's not a new book at all but um I have seen lots of people read this recently and uh, it's Kindred by Octavia E Butler. I haven't read any Octavia E Butler before and I know she's like an absolute icon in um in the kind of science fiction fantasy uh space and this all I know about this is that it's about a girl in the 70s, I think, who accidentally time travels or keeps being like yanked back in time to during the slavery era in America to save this man's life repeatedly. That is all I know. But um, I'm really excited about reading this one, especially because my friend Evie bought a coffee a bit recently and we're going to buddy read it. So that's going to be super nice. And then because, oh, she's played the piano. Sorry about that. Uh, because I've been a little bit worried about how uh, long some of the books I already have to read this month, I picked one of the tiniest books on my shelf, which is one that I bought quite recently. So it's not exactly about getting rid of the TBR, but it does, it does feed into the impatience. So I bought this a couple of weeks ago from a new uh, indie bookshop in my area called One Bee Books. If you're also in the Northeast, it's in Heaton in Newcastle. This is Idle Burning by Rin Usami, which is translated from the Japanese by Asa Yaneda. And this is a book about fandom and online culture and cancel culture, I think. And I'm just, I'm really excited about it. I know 
Jen Campbell loved this book last year. Lauren and the Books loved it. I'm just really looking forward to getting to it. And I think it's going to be a nice sort of palette cleanse between some of my big books that I'm reading. Because the final book, um, I'm just going to insert a cover here. It actually hasn't come out yet. So I've got a proof of this from NetGalley and it is Hours by Philip B. Williams. Now, this book is already causing quite a bit of buzz. And for once, for once in my life, I would like to be ahead of the buzz instead of chasing the buzz. So I've got it on NetGalley. It comes out, I think, on the 22nd of February. But I think this is, it's hard to tell on the uh, EPUB file. But I think this is also a pretty big book. But this is another one, a bit like... Um, Octavia E. Butler's that is a kind of like black fantasy book. I don't know a huge, a huge bit about it, but it's, it's like a woman who has some kind of magical powers who during the slavery era in America was able to like set up this utopian community and protect it. So no one knows that they're there somewhere in the middle of the US. And um, her powers, for whatever reason, start dis diminishing. And so the threat that the outside will discover them, I think. But we don't really care about uh, blurbing right now. That's not what we do in these videos generally. Um, I will read the book and then I will tell you uh, how I got on. So that's it for now. I'm just very quickly on my lunch break filming this. And um, now I'm going to go back to work and then after that I'm going to the cinema and then we're going to go and eat some delicious Indian food. So I will see you soon. Bye bye. had to come and sit here with Lewin because he is being a whiny boy because his dad is not currently living here and that makes us grumpy so um I am here with an update for you it has been quite a while since I filmed that uh that first clip um I have read one book the the two 500 page ones that I was in the middle of ended up taking longer than I thought. And I've been in like a little bit of a reading slump. I think not necessarily reflecting badly on anything that I've been reading. I just think, uh, I think I came out a little hot in January. <laughs> uh, and I was reading like in all my spare time. And I've been much better in February at pulling away a bit and doing other things. So I haven't read as much as I wanted to. So I've read one book, which I'm going to talk to you about now. And I am like close, I'm like two thirds of the way through two other ones, which I'll briefly mention at the end of this bit, but probably just catch up with you when I've actually read it. Could you stop whinging? Could you stop whinging? What is ailing you? So yeah, I did, I did finish, um, Idle Burning by Rini Semi, which I think I said at the start, um, but if I didn't, is translated by Asi Yaneda. Um, and I read this in one sitting. As you can see, it is a slim book and it is like super, super readable. And I really enjoyed it. So this is um, following a teenage girl called Akari, who is a super fan, basically, of... Um, a uh, guy called Masaki who is in a, uh, like a pop group. Stop it. In a pop group and she calls him her Oshi, her idol. Are you just going to make that noise when I talk? You are, aren't you? Do you have something to say about this book? Sweetheart, give it a rest. Good boy. 
Um, but yeah, Akari is, is known sort of online for being a real authority on, um, on this guy. Are you leaving? Okay then. She's known for being um, a real authority on this guy. So like, for example, um, at one point, uh, he tweeted something. This happens prior to the book. It's just told as a recollection, but he tweeted something that she thought didn't really like sound like him. Um, and it later turned out that one of his bandmates had stolen his phone and like sent out like a joke tweet. But like, that is the level of detail to which she can like identify his tone and everything about him. So she is very, very invested in this man. Lou, careful. You gonna lie there? Good boy. Needed to find his pillow to suckle on. So yeah, she's super invested in him. And at the start of the book, um, things are kicking off online because Masaki has been involved in like this controversy online where he has allegedly hit a fan, like punched a fan in the face and everything as we know it does has blown up kind of on, on social media platforms and lots of people are coming to her for her take on like what's been going on. And I think what I enjoyed so much about that was like the nuance um, that the author was able to bring to that topic, even though it's only a really slim book. And like, even being this small, it's like a reasonably big font and like very spaced out. And there are some like little pictures things. So it's really not many words at all, this book. Um, but yeah, there was so much nuance in that discussion of, uh, you know, some people being like absolutely outraged and wanting to cancel him and other people like stalwartly sticking by their guy and Akari finding herself sort of wanting to occupy this space where she is absolutely devoted to this guy but she doesn't they don't know what happened and so it was really and so she doesn't kind of want to get super involved in it because like they don't know right um and it's interesting because that feels so reasonable and yet how many times have we either been involved in ourselves or just witnessed online these like massive like snowstorms that happen um, when incidents like this happen where people don't actually know. And we, I mean, I don't think this is a spoiler, but we don't find out what actually happened because Akari never finds out what actually happened and so I really I really enjoyed the way that that was explored in the book and there was like such a, let me see if I can find it um there was such an interesting exploration or like explanation of um parasocial sort of relationships particularly like when people talk about uh especially young girls especially young girls who have like obsessions about musicians or actors or whoever it is. And they, I think get patronized quite a lot for their enjoyment of that thing. And um, there was this really like bit that I just thought, oh, that's, that's so right. And people don't think of it like that. So she says, people who wanted balanced reciprocal relationships said there was something unhealthy about connections that were only one way. Stop pining over him, you don't have a chance. Why are you always the one making sacrifices for her? It was tiresome being told I was being taken advantage of when I had no expectation of getting anything in return. My devotion to my Oshi was its own reward and that worked well for me. So I just needed people to shut up about it. I wasn't looking for my Oshi to return my feelings. And like, I think that's probably the case for like lots of people. It's definitely like how I felt when I was like a teenager, like that sort of being very invested in wanting to perceive someone and see them and feel like you understand them, but not necessarily actually wanting that to be a two way street. And I thought that was really, really well explored as well as just the latent sexism 
in like girls can't be fans of um you know a male singer without it being like a weird thing or without you sort of feeling a little bit sorry for them but yeah um, a grown man can be like screaming and crying at a sports match and like nobody thinks that's weird and then throughout or like in and amongst that conversation there are also these hints throughout the book about why this relationship um one-sided though it is might be so important to Akari. So we don't ever get given any specifics about um, what's going on um, with her life or her body or her health, but there's definitely like, she struggles in school and she can't seem to bring herself to, she can't make herself do what she needs to do or what her family tell her that she needs to do. So her older sister is like academically quite, gifted or even just like academically quite normal and Akari isn't and um she doesn't understand why she finds things much harder than other people do she just feels like she can't do it and her sister and her mum to some extent they they all just sort of write Akari off as being like lazy but it seems like there is something more going on with her, whether or not that might be like that she's got some kind of chronic illness or chronic fatigue, whether she's just got poor mental health or possibly some kind of neurodivergence that is acting as a barrier from her being able or feeling able to act and perform in society the way that people expect her to. And so in a way, her sort of devotion to her Oshi is this form of like escapism and it gives her something to grab onto. It's something that she doesn't find difficult to do. I thought that was really interesting um, and really well explored. And actually, I think it was quite clever to not sort of medicalize it and give it a specific label and i i also liked in this book the way um social media comes across there's an interview at the end of um the end of this edition with the author and she's asked something along the lines of did like al almost like is social media to blame for akari's obsession um does it exacerbate her obsession with her oshi and um, Rinusami says, no, I don't think it, I don't think social media does, but I think it exacerbated the anxiety she felt about her, obse her obsession. And I, I liked that response because I do, I do think that came through in the book. And also it's this idea of, um, it's not the, that she's got an obsession with this idol it doesn't really like affect her life in in one way but the anxiety she feels surrounding that obsession does and so i think it's it's nice when social media is being explored in a book as like not only negative not wholly negative because she gets a huge amount of joy from being able to talk about her oshi online and share her experience and he does like these like live interviews on like Instagram lives or whatever quite regularly. And so she has this like, is able to have this interaction with him in a way that like wouldn't have been facilitated without um, social media. And yet we know from like eras where there wasn't social media that we still had obsessive fans over people. That's not like a new thing that's sprung up just because we have the, um, the internet. And yeah, I think, I think there were interesting conversations, um, really just kind of the start of an interesting conversation in this book around um, separating the art from the artist and, and how we do that and how we navigate that um, socially, which I'm really interested in. And I, I know Lauren over at Lauren and the Books is, was reading a book in one of her videos that's like a nonfiction book about that, like, um, how do we engage or should we engage with the art of someone who has sort of 
shown themselves to be wanting in some way because that's a big scale right from oh that person's got some opinions that i don't personally hold right the way through to that person is like a, like has done something actively bad um and where those lines lie so i think if you, if you find yourself interested in those sorts of conversations online then this is definitely a book that you would enjoy it also um reminded me quite a lot of um convenience store woman um and yeah i really i really really enjoyed it um and it's easily easily one that you can just sit down and, and get through in an afternoon yeah that is that is your update for now um and it might be a bit of a sprint finish now to the end to the end of to the end of february but sometimes reading is like that and i did say in my um goals video that i wanted to get better at um doing other things other than reading and i have been doing some bits and pieces of writing i've been uh dusting off my uh poetry writing it's pretty pretty painful going but it's uh it's been um, <laughs> that's been fun but it does it does mean i haven't had as much time for reading as i as I would normally have had but yeah so I'm gonna go and you're probably gonna see um probably some dog walk stuff I was gonna think of like can I do something else for b-roll but it's probably gonna be a dog walk isn't it <laughs> it's not it might not be morning for you but morning from me in the morning um i have two books to talk to you about and the first one is i who have never known men by jacqueline hartman which is translated from the french by ros schwartz um this i think i said in the intro was a book that was recommended to me uh, by a bookseller at the Brilliant Houseman's Books. If you've never been, um, it's like round the corner from King's Cross Station in London. So if you're ever waiting for a train from King's Cross and you've got time to kill, it's a brilliant indie bookshop that specialises in um, radical books. So it's got like loads of really great um, anti-colonial books, anti-racism books, loads and loads of queer stuff as well um but i picked this one up because the bookseller recommended it to me and um i think it was first published in the late 90s but this edition which has an introduction from sophie mcintosh is from the 2019 edition and i think since this came out i've seen this book crop up a lot more and particularly in like the last 18 months i've seen a lot more people talk about it on social media so i bought it last year very much at the behest of this uh, brilliant bookseller whose name I can't remember um, in Houseman's and I've put off reading it a little bit and I think part of what um, had put me off is that I just watched the film adaptation of Women Talking which isn't a book that I've read um, and I thought that that was going to be a film that I really enjoyed and I ended up really not enjoying it um, and I think I was worried that while that film was in my head that I would bring too much of that to this because it is a little bit similar but actually um having read this now it's not similar at all and I really really enjoyed this book um well maybe enjoyed isn't the word but I I love this book I loved it so it's told in three distinct parts and I think I'm mostly just going to talk about the first part because 
even though it's written as a recollection so you can make certain assumptions about possibly the direction of travel that the book's going to move in i really don't want to be in any way spoiling anything about this book for you um which is not to make you think that it's incredibly plot driven and and really really twisty but i just i didn't know where it was going and i think it's best to go into it not knowing so the book opens with um these 40 women of which our unnamed narrator is one, um, and they are living in a cage, like a literal cage with bars, a big one, um, that is patrolled by these groups of men, and they have been in this cage for a really long time, certainly since the narrator was a child, and she's now, I think, a young woman, like, I think she's is she in her early 20s? I can't remember exactly how old she is, but they've been in this cage for a really long time and they don't know why they're there and they don't really know how they got there. Um, so most of the women are older than our narrator. They were adults already um, when they came to be in the cage. So they have memories of their life as it was previously but all they really seem to remember about how they got here is like sirens and confusion and then everyone woke up in this cage and they that is where they have been since and i mentioned there that our narrator is unnamed and i don't just mean she's unnamed in the sense um that it's a literary device where we never find out her name she literally doesn't have a name because she was a child when she was put in this cage with these women um she didn't know what her name was and the women didn't didn't give her a name they just called her the child so she literally doesn't have a name and the discrepancy in their ages is a little bit of a sore point for the narrator because she the women have these memories from a world that that the narrator has no memory of at all and she feels really um distant she feels like they're withholding information from her um the book is called i who have never known men she's very interested in the concept of men and who they are because the only men she's ever encountered or has any memory of encountering are the guards who in no way interact with them um other than to like give them their food but they don't look at them they don't acknowledge them there's no kind of interaction there and and so our narrator is fascinated by by who men are and she thinks these women are, are withholding information from her. The women feel like they're protecting her from the sort of fantasy of freedom that they don't think she's ever going to experience. So why would they bother telling her about these things that are not going to do her any good? It's so clever to create, even within this group, have our narrator still be and yet further distanced from the group. She feels like they're able to take solace in this sort of shared history, shared heritage, shared experience that the women have and that she doesn't have at all. And, and Jacqueline Hartman actually was a trained psychoanalyst. And I think what I, one of the things I loved so much about this book was the internal world and how rich and nuanced and how carefully she'd thought about what happens to your brain when you exist with this much monotony and this what this much sort of of the mundane and and every day um and what what might that do to the way your brain works and so she the the main character has developed this um really complex and sustained internal world because there is so little um external stimulus really like there's nothing to do they don't have books they don't have any form of sort of entertainment it's just women in a cage they're not abused um they're not you know hurt in any way so there's not really much for them to do. And um, I thought this was so interesting. So when she is a sort of teen, early teen, she sort of accidentally gives herself an orgasm through, like, through her imagination. So she's not like 
masturbating. She's not physically touching herself, but she'd sort of created this long story that she was telling herself about trying to escape. And at the end of that story, she, she goes into a room, I think, and she's confronted by this guard, one of the younger guards who she's kind of been a little bit fixated on. Um, and like the shock and surprise in that story that she'd created for herself. I can't remember what's the word she uses for it, but it's some kind of euphemism and we understand that she's had an orgasm, but she doesn't know what an orgasm is. And she doesn't know that that's something that she can bring about in herself through physical stimulation. She only knows it as a sort of psychological journey. So she creates for herself these really long, like hours, spends hours and hours and hours creating these long stories where she's moving through like trying to escape the the cage or she's going up a staircase and it's very very slow and she she realizes that she has to sort of um trick herself like she has to lull herself into a, a false sense of security and then she has to surprise herself and that's how she brings this feeling about and I just thought that was so so like such so interesting and such an interesting way of sort of exploring how different your relationship with your body even like something that we think of as being so innate and natural how much that can be disrupted and changed when you are sort of in a in a vacuum as these women pretty much are um and another another piece of sort of like brain magic that she does is um she starts counting her heartbeats um because there's one woman that she's quite close to who told her you know that the average heart beats like 70 beats a minute or whatever it is and um she counts her heartbeats for like days and days and days and she does it so off and to such a sustained degree that she develops this really reliable internal clock where she stops consciously counting but she knows what time it is. I mean, they don't know actually what time it is because there's no clocks, because, so they've got, they're literally timeless. They've got no concept of it. The lights are always on and they dim them slightly at like nighttime, but the women don't know how long nighttime is. And then as she develops this clock system, they realize like, oh, okay, we sleep, we're normally awake for like six hours and then we sleep for like four hours or whatever it is. I think, yeah, it, it just, it was so interesting the way, um, the way she explored the the brain in that in that sense of how we can how the brain can adapt to this sort of unending <laughs> monotony um and still seek to find novelty um or to keep itself stimulated and i d i don't really want to say yeah i think that's that's all i want to say about the the plot of the of the book because like i said i don't I don't want to ruin it for <laughs> for anyone, um, but what I, I what I will speak about as some more of the themes that that are explored, um, because it is really a book about resilience in the face of adversity. But that resilience maybe doesn't look like how we would expect it to look. But it's also just really a book about who who we are or how we form our identity if we don't have access to our shared experiences or our shared pasts um and also about community and and how how important that is to our sense of ourselves so it, uh, it's asking questions like who are we without that shared history what would we look like if we were raised in a vacuum and it's it's also a book about about freedom and what what freedom really looks like um, and sort of finding pockets of freedom for yourself while being aware uh, of the limitations <laughs> of that freedom. Um, Jacqueline Hartman uh, was a Jewish author and, and, and from Belgium, which I think I said in, in the beginning. And um, her family, she and her family fled from Belgium to, I think they went to Casablanca 
uh, at the in the sort of the rise of the Nazis, and it's really hard to. Im once you know that, it's really hard to not think about um, the Holocaust in reference to some of the themes that are being explored here. Although I do think it it is more universal or has more universal sort of application than that. But I definitely think that that was a factor that was that was possibly at play as she was writing this book. And I just thought it was so engagingly written, not that much happens in it. It's it isn't very plot heavy. And yet I absolutely raced through it. And I really thought it was a masterclass in restrained and really careful plotting because as i said not that much happens but just enough happens to keep you interested but the gaps between the things happening make you ache it's i just thought she was she she somehow was able to capture monotony without the book ever feeling boring and i think that is so so difficult to do yeah, it's it's a melancholy read. It is an unsettling read. Jacqueline Hartman really allows you to experience shoulder to shoulder with the narrator all of the frustrations of not understanding what has happened to her or why it has happened. And she doesn't give us any more information than the narrator has. And I just thought it was brilliant. I really, really... I really, really loved it. So we're gonna chat about hours now. And as I said, I, I read this as um, an ebook uh, because I got um, a proof through NetGalley. So I'll just like pop, pop the cover up here. And then I will try and not like lean over as I normally do. Try and stay over this way. Um, so this is a hugely ambitious book and I feel incredibly conflicted about it. We'll get we'll get into why that is, but essentially as a as a brief overview of the plot, we are following predominantly a woman called Saint. She is a conjurer. She has some sort of folkloric witchy power. And with that power, she has gone to a number of plantations. It's this set in the southern states of America in the antebellum era. Um so during during slavery and she's gone to these plantations and she has essentially like overthrown the plantation she's killed the white plantation owners who were there she's freed a load of slaves and she's taken them to this town that was formerly occupied by white people but which they have abandoned and she establishes a community there and she protects it. So there's these stones that go around the border of the um, of the settlement and means that no one can get in. So no one can find them. So they are protected in this space. And again, a bit like in <laughs> I have never known men, they're uh, in this sort of vacuum almost. Um, and the book really follows uh, the lives of the people in this in this town. The town is called Ours. So what the book's uh what the book title is referencing so it's called ours and it follows really the people who were there so we get kind of these little episodes of we follow this family for a little while and see what happens there and then this family for a little while and, and you kind of build up this really rich tapestry of experience so the hours as i said is is the place and it's about um creating that sense of ownership and, and carving out a space that is for these people. But it's also ours in the sense of reclaiming a black history of America, almost like not separate from the experience of slavery, but at least about telling stories of black people and their lives at this time that isn't entirely about the experience of slavery and it's almost this like mythical retelling of black history in America and thematically I loved it um I thought the the magic system because it, it sort of is a magic system that 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 she has um but more on the like uh 
folkloric natural magic bit maybe kind of a, a, a bit like voodoo but not voodoo and I thought it was I thought that was all really really interesting and and well done and it's a big book so it's nearly 600 pages and so I'm not I'm not going to be able to in a quick like whatever however long I'm going to talk here 10 minutes maybe um I'm not going to be able to cover all of the themes that it touches on because obviously when you've got 600 pages you can explore a lot of ground you can cover a lot of ground but the book is asking a lot of of questions so I thought um I would I would run through I've written some of them down um but some of the questions that the book is asking are what does it mean to be truly free can we have freedom without control? Are you able to protect people without diminishing their own autonomy and freedom? How do we heal from trauma, both individually and collectively? Who do we become when we don't grapple with our own grief? Can we understand who we are without understanding where we've come from? Who are we without our memory? And if some of these questions are sounding similar to this I actually I wasn't expecting there to be so much thematic crossover but these two books I don't know if it's just because I read them obviously kind of like back to back but I I thought there was so much thematically that actually was was really similar about about these books done in very very different ways obviously and with different kind of emphases but but fundamentally some of the core questions that these two books were asking were really similar and i loved i loved all of that questioning there were also some really really nuanced um explorations of sexuality and gender expression that i really appreciated there was um a, a lot in there about uh about motherhood and about um, legacy. And I just, like I said, I cannot possibly get into everything that this book was, was grappling with. So thematically, loved it. And on a writing level, really, really liked it too. The writing was always excellent. And at some points, just stunningly, stunningly good. Actually, for large parts, it was stunningly good. Um, Philip B. Williams is also a poet, and you can tell. Um, and it's just, it was very, very, very lyrical, which really worked, I thought, with this whole sort of um, mythical, folkloric, fantastical, almost, these stories that were going on within, within the book. But, and there is a but, for me, where this book wasn't so strong was actually in the, the story, in the narrative beats as they unfolded. It begins with like one of the most brilliant opening chapters <laughs> that I've I, I can remember reading in a in a really long time. It was stunningly, stunningly good. And it is um in that opening chapter, it's the present day, and a young black man has been shot by the police and he's been killed. And in that chapter, he comes back to life. He his body is is revived. And the chapter promises that the story of this young boy who's just been shot by the police and how he has uh, revived himself. In order to understand how that's happened, we need to go back in time. And, and so we do, we do go back in time. And that's when all of the substantive stuff that I've uh, discussed happens and so you have that one chapter at the beginning which is I'm, I'm going to read you a little bit of it um so this is um towards the the, the opening chapter is only a couple of pages um but this is the the last the last paragraph um and it says to begin this journey move backwards the boy's body returns to the hot asphalt. The orange soda slides back into the bottle and the blood back into the boy's warming body. Then the boy's corpse rises and the bullets spin out from the right lung, the neck, the back of the head, the left hamstring, the right buttock, the right tricep, the left scapula, 
that his corpse becomes a living him as flecks of bone restructure and re-enter the red black wound, the broken wet resealed, the white meat sucked back into unbroken muscle, uncooked fat and closing behind the retreat of the backward flying bullet. The air the bullets once displaced returns from the curve of its displacement. The silver bullets return into the black gun like an unspeakable organ moving back into its dark element. The explosion of gunfire, now the sound of wind hissing, then roaring, then suddenly silent. And the brown finger lifts from its trigger. The boy with his back to the police as the Fanta rises back into his pocket. And further back, weeks ago, the boy is asleep in bed and a small circle of light leaves his body. The legend begins where that light leads. At the end, the boy may teach you his name. Now, I mean, how is that? How is that for an opening chapter? But it's a heavy chapter in sense of promise. And it set my expectation so high. Um, and it's not that the book doesn't deliver on that promise. It's, it's just the way in order that it does that that I personally found a little bit frustrating. So you have that amazing chapter. It's like it's like two, three pages, hard to tell on a new book because my font's always massive. So I don't know how many pages it actually is in the printed book, um, but it's not a lot. It's not a lot. And then you have, I would guess, 500 pages of hours, like following Saint, understanding her backstory, understanding the backstories of the people who were there. And then maybe the last 90 pages that really begin to make good on that promise. And for me, just the waiting was off with that, just like a little, a little bit. And I hate, I hate being the person who's like, this long book was too long. Um, but I do feel, I do feel a little bit like that. And I loved all of the individual stories, but the problem with them is that I felt like they weren't moving it forward. And because the promise of that first chapter was so explicit, I found myself getting really frustrated as I was reading. And the longer it went on with me not feeling like I was getting what I was told I was gonna get, <laughs> I, I found myself really having to push through with the reading quite a lot but I did like how it was handled towards the end I just wish there hadn't have been such I wish it hadn't taken quite so long and that some of those connections maybe had been woven back in earlier I would I do think probably on a reread there's way more stuff that is happening that is linked through but I can tell you right now I'm not going to reread this book so even though I really liked it really liked parts of it I did I did find it just a little bit a little bit a little bit frustrating in the in the author's note Philip B Williams talks about um wanting to write this epic of black history and for me I think that was almost part of the problem for me again very subjective but for me it felt like that's what he was doing it felt like he was trying to write an epic regardless of whether a big epic narrative is actually what was going to serve the story and I do I do think it would have been stronger if it had been 200 pages shorter and I feel I, I, I feel horrible about that um but here's the thing I still really recommend it because what I can tell you is just go into it knowing go into it knowing that first chapter is going to go whoop and it's going to take a really long time. So just be patient with it. And you'll probably enjoy that journey for having done that a lot more than I did. Because I just wanted to know what was... I just wanted to know. And he's very, very, very reticent <laughs> to tell you <laughs> how it's all actually going to go ahead. He really wants you to explore these characters. And I totally get it. Um, but I just had a little bit of a frustrating time with it. Um, and it is absolutely beautifully written. And I will definitely read other books by by this author in the future. So yeah, um, not, not a favourite. Really liked it. Really um, enjoyed, as I said, huge parts of it. Writing was absolutely stunning. And I do, I do recommend it. But just know, just know that 
this not it's not quite it's not quite what you think it's going to be with that first chapter okay so we've just got kindred now um and part of the reason also that may have affected my my enjoyment a little bit of hours was that i didn't want my reading i normally read a couple of books at a time but i didn't want hours and kindred to overlap because they both deal with the antebellum south i i just i didn't want to get them muddled in my head in any way although weirdly thematically it turns out that hours I think is going to have more in common with I Who Have Never Known Men. I think now you are maybe going to see, I took Lewin on a really big walk um, the other day to the Rising Sun. So I think you're going to see some footage of that now. And um, yeah, I will check in with you when I have finished Kindred. <laughs> Octavia Rue Butler, my fourth and final book for this video. And I'm going to say now, if this section is a little more fragmented than normal, I have an electrician here. So there's all sorts of reasons why I might get disrupted. Probably Lewin will start barking at some point. There may be loud drilling and also the power might go off. <laughs> fun, fun, fun. All fine. All fine. But I have finished reading. Kindred by Octavia E. Butler, and I really, really liked it, but oh my goodness, this book made me so fucking stressed. Like, so stressed. It's, it is a long time since I have had to stay up to get to the next chapter to be like assured that the characters are okay. <laughs> Good Lord. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think as I said in the beginning, this is a piece of speculative, speculative fiction from the 1970s. It was originally published um, and it follows a young woman called Dana. She is a black woman living in California and it's like 1976. She is working kind of like odd jobs, but she wants to be a writer and her husband is a white man um and he is also a writer so they kind of like met and bonded about writing stuff but even in the 70s you know electrician interrupted me what was i saying um yeah so even in this even in the 70s the fact that they're an interracial couple um is like a bit of a a bit of a thing so that's the kind of background into who are who our characters are um, and as I said in the beginning, this is a time travel book. 
And I really liked the way that that was handled. Um, so one day, Dana and her husband, Kevin, are just, uh, they've just moved into a new apartment and they are like unpacking. I think they're like bickering about like, books or something. Like they're trying to work out where their books go because, you know, both writers. And um, Dana falls down and she feels really dizzy, really nauseous, kind of blacks out. And when she wakes up, she's like in a fucking forest, um, like by a creek. And there is a young boy, a young white redheaded boy, face down in the water, drowning. So she saves him, obviously. You'd, you'd hope that that's anyone's human instinct when um, someone's in danger, especially a child. She pulls him out of the water. She gives him CPR, or at least like as good as she knows how to give him CPR because, you know, she's not a medic. Um, but she, she revives him and he, he comes back round. And as she's sort of helping him, this white woman with red hair, very clearly his mother, like arrives and is like screaming at her. Seems like really fucking mad that she's like touching her son, helping her son. And it's all a bit like weird because Dana's kind of like, uh, I saved him, you're welcome. Um, but there's just something like a little bit off. And then the dad arrives with a fucking gun and is like, who the fuck are you? And fade to black, Dana wakes back up in her living room, but like not exactly where she was. So she's like disappeared and then reappeared somewhere. And her husband is like, what the fuck just happened? Because for Dana, a few minutes passed. And for Kevin, it was only a few seconds. Like she disappeared. He was like, what the fuck? And then she's there again, just behind him. And that is basically kind of how this like tug works. So what we slowly start to realize through kind of a series of episodes like this is that um, Rufus, for some reason, there is a connection between Rufus, the young boy, and Dana. And he can he basically somehow he doesn't mean to he doesn't know he's doing it but when his life is at risk Dana is pulled back into the past to save him and at first she doesn't know that that's where she's going she doesn't know she's back into the past she thinks she's just traveled through space she doesn't think she's also traveled through time and when she realizes the era which is you know height of slavery fucking Georgia no Maryland Maryland um that is a, obviously a real fucking problem because she is a black woman and a black woman in what year is it? 1815 is going to be assumed to be a slave. So every time she gets pulled back, she is in so much danger. But she sort of, they sort of realise that it's going to keep happening. So she has to sort of try and weirdly ingratiate herself into this family for the time that she's there to try and preserve her safety while she's there. Because while they know what pulls her into the past, they don't know really what gets her home. And sometimes she is there for months. And when she gets back home, only like a few hours have passed. So the past runs much faster than her present. And that's kind of, really disorienting um as a reader and also for Dana because it basically means that she doesn't catch her breath I think there's only a couple of hours between the first and second time that she's pulled back in like in the present chronology and it's just the pace that this book moves at is so so stressful it's so stressful but I really really I really liked it I, th I think the relationship between Rufus and Dana is fascinating because for her time is obviously passing while she's in the past in the south um but m time is moving differently for her than it is for Rufus so she's seeing his life like on fast forward so she meets him when he's a very young child and then periodically throughout his life when he's a few years older a few years after that he is an incredibly accident prone man and then as he grows up a man who invites accident upon himself 
uh, and is very regularly in need of saving and increasingly the situations that he finds himself in they're not always things that she feels equipped to save him from one time he has like dengue fever and she's like i don't i don't know how to how to save him it's almost like a sibling level sort of um affection that they have but i think in both of their cases it's like a kind of grudging affection because neither of them likes who the other person seems to be at their core and yet they feel this connection that they have that is obviously literally spanning like space and fucking time i thought this was going to be a spoiler it happens relatively early on and i wasn't going to say it until i realized it does say on the back it's an extraordinary story of two people bound by blood so that is the link between dana and um rufus he is her like great 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 grandfather um which is a bit of a shock for her because she didn't know she had any um white heritage um and so she has to keep saving him even as he becomes this let's say very much a man of his time and has these problematic attitudes he cares for dana in his own way but he's also incredibly manipulative and incredibly entitled he feels entitled to her attention to her presence he tries whatever he can to make her stay with him um and yeah in spite of all that and dana getting really frustrated by him she has to keep saving him even as his actions become more and more deplorable she has to keep saving him until her um ancestor is born she has to wait until like the next rung of the ladder the sort of genetic ladder is is there because otherwise she's gonna cease to exist um and yeah the tussle in their relationship the tension in it there's there's this like real sense of like poker between the two of them they're just they're constantly trying to like second guess the other person's motives they're trying to figure each other out they're trying to work out how to manipulate the other person particularly rufus probably more than more than dana but dana is obviously as i said having to try and engineer the situation to be as conducive to her fucking survival as possible and that puts her in a really difficult position with the other black people um in the story alongside her because she she ends up having a slightly elevated position in the household because of this relationship that she has with rufus and i thought it was just so so interesting and um i also thought the um the relationship between Kevin and Dana was really interesting because at points Kevin travels back with her and obviously his experience as a white man is very different to hers and he is really struggling to see how his wife is treated in that situation but then also know that he has to play along otherwise he risks endangering both of them and um yeah i think that was a really interesting foil because there are other interracial relationships that are happening in the past chronology um that that it's just a really interesting to kind of compare and contrast how those are how those are dealt with i do think there were there were a couple of things that like i didn't like love but they're really quite small complaints there was a couple of um a couple of mentions drawing contrasts between um the slavery era and well what would have been modern for when um contemporary for when this book was written uh so like mentions of like apartheid south africa um on the news and stuff and some of those moments felt a little bit heavy-handed but then i am saying that as a reader reading this 50 years after it was originally written so i i think maybe that's just like uh something that has changed with kind of more i don't know awareness more education and, and learning about things like this um but then the other thing is that so that the opening of this book it starts um towards the end of the narrative so dana has just woken up 
and she's in a hospital. We don't know at the time where she's like woken up from because obviously we haven't read the book yet. Um, but she wakes up and her arm is incredibly injured to the point where um, she knows she's she's gonna have to have um, an amputation or she's already had an amputation of her arm. And we don't know what's happened to her, but we know that the police suspect that her husband is the cause of it. Um, and she's very adamant that Kevin didn't hurt her, that it was an accident um, and she somehow did it, did it herself. We don't really know what the injury was, but it sets up that. And then as the narrative unfolds, you do find out right towards the end what caused that injury. And I found the reveal of that a little bit dissatisfying, but on the whole, I didn't mind because actually i'd totally forgotten about her arm because i was just so wrapped up in this book even though it's like nearly 300 pages i actually think this is a this could be like if you had the time a one sitting wonder like you could just sit and read this it is a lot you might not want to read it all in one go because it is pretty unrelenting and very very graphic at at moments it will make you sick it will make you angry um but yeah i i really really i really really liked it um i think it would also be um a really good book if you haven't read a lot of speculative fictional kind of like i wouldn't call this science fiction although some people do um but yeah it's there's not really science in in this it's definitely kind of like speculative fiction or possibly possibly fantasy but um if you're interested in that it, I think this is a good sort of entry book because it's got the the world and the mechanisms of it are all quite simple. Like the rules are all quite easy to grapple with and it really puts the character, the journey and the visceral experience of it at front and center. So um, I think if you kind of like want to like dip your toe in um, things that are, that are a little bit towards the science fiction fantasy world and you don't know where to start this might actually be a really a really good place to um i will be definitely picking up some some more octavia e. butler at, at some point although i have heard lots of people say that this is their favorite octavia e. butler um so it's always when that's the situation you wonder oh do i just keep it as this one but i think I, if i see some in the library i'll i'll definitely pick them up but yeah really enjoyed it. So that has been the end of my second experiment um, into just picking a few books at the start of the month that I fancy for no other thematic reason than I fancy reading them at the moment. And I think it's worked, it's worked quite well. There were definitely some that I, I liked more than, more than others. And I feel like this one more than January's has had like more overlap or correlation in the themes that were cropping up. Um, even I was thinking about this and I was like, oh, Idle Burning feels like maybe like a bit of an outlier in terms of themes. But I do think there are elements of that, how we, how we understand ourselves and our place in the world and how it feels if you feel like you don't fit in into that world and the, the, stories and narratives that we curate for ourselves and also I think with um with idol burning almost that that element of um your brain creating what you need like a kind of um your brain protecting itself and, and soothing itself with something when other difficult things are potentially going on so yeah I think I think actually if I had to I could link all four of these books in an essay, I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed coming on this journey with me. I will be doing the same thing again in March, although possibly not picking a nearly 600 page book. Um, I might leave my long books for like no time requirements. Do you know what I mean? Because I did want to get this vlog finished and up in February. So uh, that put a bit of pressure on ours. I think in future, no big books, unless I'm on annual leave. Um, but yeah, let me know if you've read any of these books, if you have enjoyed them, what your thoughts are. 
or if you're planning on picking any of them up having heard me talk about them i mean obviously ours if you're interested in that one i would love to hear your thoughts on that after you've read it and then yeah that might be a little while depending on how much time you have on your hands um but yeah thank you very much if you've enjoyed this video do give it a little thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't because i will be doing one of these every month so thank you very much and i will see you soon bye <laughs>